Hello everybody and welcome back to Creating Eskimon. Now before I actually add anything new, I just want to better explain something that several people seem to be confused by, and that was the walking. So firstly, it does appear that the player sort of just teleports to a new location when the user enters some kind of movement input such as X10. And this confused some people because like, what if the player wanted to move 10 spaces to the right but there was a wall in the way, 3 spaces to the right? Wouldn't the player just sort of go through the wall? Or perhaps the player's just sort of moving around in tall grass trying to find a wild Askimon. Wouldn't their chances be a lot less if they're just sort of jumping around in the grass a lot? Well, luckily this is not what happens. So here is the function that handles the player moving when the player enters a direction followed by a number. Let's just say the player enters x5, which causes the x offset argument to be equal to 5. The key thing to notice here is that there's a for loop which runs x offset times. In other words, this causes the player to move just one step x offset times. And in turn, this allows me to do checks every time the player moves one step, such as collisions and soon to be other things, before actually moving the player. Another thing of the walking I know many people weren't exactly the biggest fan of was the whole x or y followed by a number to move the player, such as x10, y10, or whatever, to move the player to the right or up. And so because of this, I actually added another way of moving the player, and that is using WASD controls. So the way this works is you type in a bunch of W's, A's, S's and D's and then you hit enter. And then depending on what you typed, this is where the player moves to. For example, if I typed in W followed by two D's, this would move the player up by one and then two to the right. Or if I was to type a bunch of W's, D's and S's, it would move the player around the river. So the way this works is when the player types in a WASD command, it will loop through all the chars in that buffer there, and then it will just simply move the player one step at a time depending on what the character is. And on top of this, you can just press enter without actually typing anything, and it will just repeat the last command you said. So for example, I just press the D key, and I'm just holding down enter now, and I'm just continuously moving to the right. Anyways, back to my code now, where well, there's actually a problem with the current game state system. In games, it's pretty typical to have the pattern that you're seeing right here, where you first of all get input from the user, you then update the game, and then you draw whatever's going on. But when it comes to a game played in the console window without any real-time input, things work a little bit differently. Right here is the input function for exploring the world. Whenever I was getting user input, I was basically just throwing whatever they said into a value, and then later on in the update function, I was then just using this value to update the game. But as pointed out by this GitHub issue here, this was pretty pointless because I might have well just been doing the updating directly after the input rather than storing it and then doing it later. The same person who realised this issue actually very kindly fixed the issue himself. He also made a pull request of which I then accepted and then merged into the main codebase. So yeah, thank you. So with all that out of the way, that's actually create something for the game now. So when you're programming, it's pretty common to want to sort of like see what value is being stored in the variable at any current time. And this is very handy for things like debugging or to make sure a value is what it's meant to be. Now there are many different ways to do this, but the most easiest is just a quick and dirty print statement because you can just add line of code printing out the value you want to see and then delete it afterwards when you no longer need to look at it anymore. Now the problem I have with this is that my game uses print statements to, you know, draw the game. So if I was also using print statements for debugging, then it just wouldn't work because my game would just get drawn over the value that I'm trying to look at. So my solution to this was to just sort of make my own console and then add that to the user interface of the game. So the way this works is I created a struct called console and then just pass that into the game state's update and draw functions so that they can use it. This console struct has a function called write which basically allows them to write a string to the console which then stores that string into a vector. And then each loop of the game this vector of strings will just get reprinted to the user interface to a render section dedicated to the console. So this can be seen working here where the console is on the right hand side of the user interface. For testing purposes I just print out the player's new position every time they move. I also added colour support, as you can see when I use WASD commands it's printed out as green, but when I use the X10, Y10 commands it just gets printed out as white. So this new console interface could actually be used for a lot more than just debugging purposes, so for example you might be talking to someone in the game and whatever they're saying could get printed out to this new console. Or it could be used to print out instructions when the player types in a help command which tells the user the controls for how to play the game. 
So anyways, the next thing I wanted to do was continue what I started in the last video by expanding on exploring the world. And the thing I wanted to add was support for portals, where portals are tiles that take the player to somewhere else, such as doors to enter buildings, stairs to change floors, ladders to also change floors, or just entrances to things such as caves. So to do this, I created a structure called Portal, which just holds a little bit of information about where it goes to. Let's just take for example this portal at the bottom of this Pokemon Center that we'll just say is in Lily Cove City. The world destination of the portal is the map chunk coordinate within the world where the portal goes to. For example, this portal would go to a chunk which represents Lily Cove City. And then the local destination is the offset from the top left corner of that chunk. But I then realised this is a little silly because I, well, I can basically just store the absolute world position, which is the offset from the top left corner of the entire world, rather than doing all this, well, overly complicated thing with the whole offset from the local position and the chunk position. But in order to actually get the portals to work as portals, the information about them had to be encoded in the map chunk files. Before I added portals, the only data stored in these files was the char tile maps, and so I had to split this file into different sections, so each section contains different information about the map chunk. These different file sections are identified by a tag. For example, the tile map is identified by the map tag, and the portal data is identified by the portals tag. So now that the portals are loaded into the program, it's time to actually make them work. And of course, this involves using the portal data from the chunk file. The first two numbers in the data represent the local position within that map chunk that the portal is actually located in. And the final two digits are the destination location, which is where the portal actually takes the player in the world. And these numbers just literally represent the coordinates. On the bottom is a portal on the other side where the portal on the top actually takes the player to. As you can see the coordinates are basically exactly the same, just inverted. So anyways, after all of that it's simply a matter of checking if the player is standing on the portal each time the player moves, and if they are then just simply move them to the destination location. So this can be seen working here, where the one symbol is representing the portal, just so you can see where it is. So within this map chunk, the portal is located at the coordinates 916, and it takes the player to the world coordinates of 10223, which can be seen by the data on the right. When the player stepped in the portal, it took the player to that location, which can be seen by the numbers at the top of the console on the right side of the user interface. So this portal, located in a different chunk, is at the local coordinates of 223, and when stepped on, it will take the player back to the coordinates of 916. Unfortunately, the problem with this is I have to put in the coordinates of the destination of each portal into the map files manually, which is very error prone, because it's very easy to put in the wrong coordinates. And so because of this, I decided to make some kind of map slash portal editor which would write the portal coordinates for me. Unfortunately, the code for this is a little bit sloppy, so I'd rather not get into the details, at least for now. So anyways, let's test if it works. In the middle of the map there, I placed a portal, and I want it to go to that portal over there, which is a building with the map coordinates of 100 and 100. There is another portal in the building, and I want it to connect to the portal there, which is another building with the map coordinates of 100, 101. So in-game, I can type in editor to load up the editor, and then I can type in the map that I want to edit, which is at location 00, by typing in load map 00. So now to edit the portal at the centre, I have to first enter portal mode, which I can do by typing in portal. So I want to connect this portal to one at the location of 100 100, so I can do this by typing in set dest 100 100. So now I need to select the portal at the bottom, which I can do by pressing next, because currently it's selecting the one at the top. And I can finish off the connection by typing in select. And then as you can see, it's added those portal coordinates to the map files. So now in game I'm able to use those portals to access the buildings and then go back outside or whatever and it works exactly as expected. And with that being said that's the end of today's video, thank you for watching. So anyways, quick shout out to my Patreon supporters, thank you Alchemic, James Ritchie, Lucas Derenberger, Nate Brown, Neil Blakely Milner, Alan Fernandez, Timo Schrader, Kilo Crazy Man, and finally Timothy Gibbons, thank you everyone for your support. So anyways, once again, thank you for watching, as per usual, source code will be available in the description below, and um, see you next time.